WWF have recently released their Living Planet Report. It's a biannual report which looks at trends in biodiversity and the health of the planet. The big stat that you might have seen is that Earth is losing biodiversity at a rate only seen during mass extinctions. This is a huge piece of information to process, but just one small part of a much longer report about the importance of biodiversity and why it's under threat. So in this video, we're going to take a closer look at the report to try and understand the science behind it and understand what it means for us and our planet. But first up, what is biodiversity? Biodiversity basically refers to all the different kinds of plants and animals that live on planet Earth and they interact with each other in loads of different ways to keep the Earth running smoothly. Generally, when people think about biodiversity loss, they might think of elephants or big cats living really far away, but in reality, the loss of biodiversity affects everybody everywhere. The loss of any species, even a worm or a beetle or a frog, can have a huge impact on the way that the balance works. Easy examples are if there were no trees like this guy, then there would be no oxygen. And if there were no bees, then there would be no one to pollinate fruit or nuts. Biodiversity is also really important for stuff like medicine. A lot of the treatments that we've developed in recent years for everything from painkillers to cancer treatments are inspired by nature. And if we lose out on species, then we might miss out on the next big blockbuster treatment. To find out a little bit more about the report, we're off to speak to Tony from WWF, who can fill us in on all the details. I am here with Tony from WWF, who is going to tell us a little bit more about a new report that they've released about biodiversity. So can you tell me exactly what the report is? So every two years, WWF publishes a report called the Living Planet Report. In that is a piece of analysis we call the Living Planet Index. Mm -hmm. And that is a summary of many thousands of data sets gathered across the globe looking at the changing populations of vertebrates, mammals, birds, reptiles and fish. And this piece of analysis enables us to tell over time the changing populations of animals on Earth, basically. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is really one of the key indicators we have as to the state of nature. What we've now found this time and as we have found for the previous 20 years that we've been doing this work, is a progressive decline in nature to the point now where this summary shows us that animal populations are now 60% lower than they were in 1970. So this is getting on for a two-thirds reduction in the abundance of animals on Earth, which is a terrifying statistic. And what are the... What are the reasons that this decline has been happening? In a single phrase, it is human consumption. That's the basic bottom line. And you can see different manifestations of that. And actually, whilst we might be tempted to think that it's aeroplanes and cars and plastic that is causing this, mm -hmm. actually the main problem uh, behind that continuing decline of wildlife populations is our food system. It's what we eat. That is the big reason for this continuing decline. And how does what we eat affect biodiversity? So there are a few ways in, in which this works. One reason, which has been a lot in the news over, over recent years, is deforestation, opening up more land for oil palm plantations, soya bean plantations, for example. So that's a continuing pressure, is, is the demand for more land. And then another comes once the land has been cleared and we introduce monocultures of crops that basically wipe out any wildlife that's left in the landscape. So in this country, for example, much of the land was cleared by the time of the Roman occupation, nearly 2,000 years ago, and yet the wildlife was still largely here until after the Second World War. And what happened then is that we intensified farming, more chemicals, more machinery, more intensity, bigger fields, fewer varieties of crops, all of those things hammering the remaining wildlife to the point now where in this country we're still seeing the continuing decline. Mm -hmm. And so this is a global phenomenon and is represented not only in agriculture but also what we're taking from the sea. So the biggest impact really on marine ecosystems is the effect of fishing gear. There are other pressures on top coming from global warming and so on. But actually uh, the way in which we, we choose to feed ourselves, you can see in all these different impacts. And so that's what we need to change if we're going to not only hang on to what's left, but crucially begin to restore 
some of the populations that have declined because at the end of the day the wildlife that's out there is 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 really reflecting the state of the planet mm -hmm. and that planet is the only place we've got to live and so if the declining health of the planet is a problem for animals in the end it will be a problem for us so that was my next question is if this decline keeps happening at the rate that it is happening without a change to human consumption what does the planet look like so um, what we're documenting is a decline in so-called biodiversity. And so biodiversity is, is really uh, the variety of life on Earth. Increasingly, we're calling it the web of life because it really is about, yes, there's a series of connections, everything's interconnected. It's literally a web of, of relationships that sustain the living fabric of this planet. And the more we tear out those individual threads, in the end, the more the whole thing or parts of the thing will likely collapse. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the benefits that humans are getting from that web of life, it's literally everything. 100% of our economic system is founded upon that system working. Whether it's the recycling of carbon into forests or into the ocean, whether it's the insects that are pollinating our crops, whether it's the billions of microorganisms in a handful of soil that are recycling nutrients, whether it's the upland wetlands that are, that are purifying water and protecting us from flooding, all of these system elements in different ways are supporting us. But of course, in our ever more urbanised settings, I think it's increasingly difficult for people to see this. Mm -hmm. And so one of the jobs we have to do is, is to connect people to the fact that this is not simply the sad disappearance of beautiful animals, this is the decline of the human system too and if we don't arrest this then in the end there will be consequences for people and potentially very serious consequences. So I've read the report you can find it online but um, it'll be great to hear what you think the headlines people need to take away from the report are. It's that nature matters and that it's vital for our well-being, for our economy, our health, our security and if we don't protect nature then in the end we're not protecting people and we need to reverse this decline for reasons of human well-being. I think that actually is really quite a change in perspective. Yeah, there's something you say in the report quite a lot, which is that it's not just a nice to have. Yeah. It's not uh, something that's a luxury, it's something that is essential. Essential for human well-being. Yeah, there is only one Earth. I mean, you know, people sometimes forget that actually there is nowhere else to go. This is it. <laughs> um, and what is the role for governments and businesses in helping people to make changes? Well, I think the, 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 the people who are in the strongest positions of influence and power are the ones who really need to be leading on this. And I think it is right to say that, you know, the politicians and the uh, large companies, you know, they, they do have a disproportionate influence on all of this. Certainly everyone has uh, a role in terms of how we consume and how we behave, but actually it's the people who've got control of the legal system, policy making, public spending and who are putting consumer goods into the market and providing services for us all, those are the people who really need to get this as a matter of some urgency. And I, I do think it, it is now increasingly clear to some governments that looking after nature is their best economic and social strategy. Some countries have got that. Costa Rica is one of my favourite examples where they uh, not only stopped deforestation, they doubled the forest cover um, compared with the mid-1980s and at the same time they doubled the country's GDP and they did this by investing in nature as an economic strategy. Companies too are beginning to see that you can't have endless economic and growth in, in businesses without looking after the natural underpinning of the system. So for example, cocoa companies, companies that are growing cocoa to make chocolate, they have realised there is a clue in the name, in a rainforest. The forest is producing rain, and without rain you can't produce crops, and so keeping the forest becomes an essential part of the business strategy for producing multi-billion pound business uh, models that rely on agricultural produce. In this country, for example, we have the Treasury currently blocking the Department for the Environment that wants to bring forward a strong new Environment Act for reasons of short-term expediency. But really, where does the long-term value lie? Is it in a little bit more economic growth next year and the year after, or is it in the restoration of natural habitats, soil quality, the protection of our water environment and the animals in the countryside and in the cities? I think increasingly we can say that is where the real value is. And if we agree with you and we want governments to make these changes, how can we, as a voting public, try and influence that? 
So I think it's, it's essential that people get involved in the campaigning and making a visible voice that change is wanted. And actually one of the things that I find most encouraging at the moment is the extent to which young people now are beginning to voice their concerns. They're asking for more to be done on this. That voice is being heard in different places. I think the reason we're seeing a little bit more greenery now coming into the political discussion is because of the under 25s and you know the group that are about to start voting in their, in their teens. I think this is gonna be something that, that will become uh, unignorable in politics. It already is. So it's vital that people exercise that voice. You can do it as an individual. You can join campaigns. At WWF, we have our Fight for Your World campaign that we have out there right now. And obviously the more people that join that, the better. We're fighting for strong nature laws here in the UK, a sustainable food system, doing more about carbon, ending unnecessary single-use plastics being put into the market. All that stuff, in the end, is down to what we want. Because if we say to the companies and the politicians, we don't want this anymore, we want something cleaner, greener and different, they will have to do it. Yeah. Um, because in the end, the only place they get power from is us as voters and consumers. So we do all have to stand up and start to say something about this. That's the most powerful thing. And as I say, you can do it as an individual in the way you shop, in the way you consume, uh, or you can join an organised campaign of the kind that we at WWF run, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, RSPB. Everybody's doing uh, different work to try and move this along. But actually, I think if there was one thing right now is to get behind this campaign for an Environment Act here in the UK to try and reverse the loss of biodiversity to repair the web of life here in Britain. So my question is, looking at this report, uh, which is global and has a, a huge amount of data in it, how can we translate that into our homes and make change in the choices that we make every single day? Use up less resources, energy and water. Everyone can do a bit of that. Just get beautiful and useful things into your house, ban everything else, <laughs> and then just be thoughtful about food and, uh, you know, go for the least waste options and try to reduce the amount of, of, of dairy and livestock as well, which is good for public health as well. It was really interesting to speak to Tony and find out a little bit more about the report. I think the main thing that I took away is that Nature is not a nice to have and anything that we lose is going to have a massive impact because it upsets the balance of the way everything works. But it was also really empowering to hear that there is stuff that we can do to make a difference. From using our voice to let governments and businesses know that we're concerned, to eating less meat and dairy and not filling our houses with stuff that we don't want or need. If you want to have a read of the full report, I've put a link below. Read through and let me know what you think, if you knew any of this stuff before or if it's coming as a shock to you, let me know in the comments. And that's the end of the episode. To find out more and to get inspired, head to our website, www.hubbub.org.uk, where you'll find loads of top tips to give you the spark to do things differently. Tune in for the next episode and come and join the Hubbub.